the Lord. All right. We are ready. Pentecost Sunday. What a joy it is to be in God's house. Amen? Amen. And we are going to dive into his word in just a moment. But Pentecost Sunday, Pente means 50th, 50 days after the Passover for the nation of Israel. So 50 days after Christ was uh, celebrating his fast Passover with the disciples. And, of course, we know that he went to the cross, took upon the sins of the whole world, upon his own body. Amen? Amen. He became sin who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. Amen. Amen. We, we are made the righteousness of God in Christ, uh, in Christ, because we are crucified with him. So, so the Feast of Pentecost, the day of Pentecost, Pentecost Sunday, when the Holy Spirit was poured out and the birth of the church was now formed. Amen. The birth of the body of Christ. And here we are today, over 2,000 years later, celebrating the risen Son of God on the day of Pentecost. Amen. So good to have you. Have your Bible. Zechariah. The prophet, right before Malachi, and you know i got to say it, right before Malici, right? If you're Italian. All right. Zechariah. Boy, wasn't that music good today? The anointing of God is here, and it's here to destroy every yoke of bondage in your life. Amen. Now listen. Some people have called me narrow-minded because I believe and I teach that there's only one way to heaven. Right? Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Acts 4 and 12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other, nor is there any other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Then the name above every name, the name of Jesus Christ. Amen? In Matthew 7, verse 13 and 14, it says, Enter in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, broad is the way that leads uh, to destruction. And there be many that go in thereat, but straight is the gate, narrow is the way that leads to life everlasting. And Jesus said there would be few that find it. I fear that there are many people sitting on church pews today who, who think that they are born again. They think that they are on their way to heaven, when in reality, they're just living a formality. And they're not born again. They're not changed from the inside out. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You may go to church for the kids program or the music or the pastor or, or uh, just to have a social activity to, to say that you've done something good for the week or to have contacts for business. But I'm telling you, Christ marks your territory. And he knows where you've been and he knows what you've heard. And he's going to hold you accountable for what you have heard. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 7, verse 21, He says, Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but they which do the will of my Father. He said, For many will come unto me in that day and say, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? In your name did we not cast out devils? In your name did we not perform many wonderful good works? Yet Jesus will say unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye who work iniquity. I fear that people know a lot about God. They know a lot about Jesus Christ, but their life does not add up. And I've got news for you, ladies and gentlemen. He that practices sin, the Bible says, 1 John 3 and 9, is of the devil. But the good news is, Christ came to destroy the works of the devil. Therefore, when you put your faith in him, he gives you the grace. Everybody shout grace. Grace to live above the sin that wants to control your life. Shout amen. I'm tired of hearing this sugar cake gospel. I am. This cheap grace gospel that you can live and you can do this a little, you can do that a little, and it's all right. But it's not all right. Jesus said it was a narrow way, a narrow way that leads to life everlasting. And he's calling you out today, and he's calling you out to the foot of the cross to repent. Acts 3.19, repent ye therefore that, that your sins may be blotted out. For when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Are you in a dry place? Are you in a place of anxiety and depression? Well, maybe it's time to repent. Repent means to change your mind. Not turn away from like you hear before. It means to change your mind. To set your mind upon Christ. To become a living sacrifice every single day. Giving your life to the Lord. And allowing Him to renew you in the spirit of your mind. And what's going to happen? He's going to wash you with the water of His Word. Word. Say amen, somebody, amen. and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But he's calling for an all-out commitment. Amen. 
He's not calling for part-time Christianity on Sunday and sometimes on Wednesday if you feel like it. And if it's not too far of a drive. Nope. He's calling you to die with him. In fact, Luke 9, 23, Jesus said, If any man will come after me, let him first deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. This is a daily walk with God. The only people that are taking up crosses are people who are getting ready to die upon them. So if you're going to take up your cross for Jesus Christ, you have to die to yourself. Galatians 2.20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives on the inside of me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself just for me. We're dying with Christ today. When these people are baptized after service, they're telling you that. They're telling you that they've died with Christ and that they've went under and they've been buried with Christ only to resurrect unto new life. Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy has he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewal in the Holy Ghost. That means if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things pass away. Old habits fade in the distance. But everything else becomes new in Jesus Christ. And that can only happen at the foot of the cross where you bow and give your entire life, body, soul, and spirit. And when you get to that place, that's when everything else will dissipate and you can stand in line with the Holy Spirit and be filled with the power of God. Amen. Amen. Pentecost. Zechariah chapter 4. Are you there? Is that what I said? Zechariah chapter 4. Big day for willing vessels. And it all begins right here, Pentecost Sunday. Amen. Zechariah chapter 4. Now, the prophet Zechariah, he's prophesying to a people, to a generation who was building, rebuilding rather, the temple of God in Jerusalem. If you'll remember in the Old Testament, if you study your Bible, men like Nehemiah, like you read before, and Ezra, they were called out of, uh, of, of the land of Persia to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple of God that the Babylonians had destroyed. And during the rebuilding of that temple, uh, they ran into some bumps in the road. In fact, the governor uh, Cyrus said, we're going to stop building this temple because there's no need for it. So, of course, they got discouraged and spiritual lethargy set in. Boy, I could preach an hour right there. Amen. Spiritual lethargy, just being outright lazy. Padded pews, crystal chandeliers, air conditioning, that's all good. Heated baptisms, and yet we're still not happy. We've been coddled too much, ladies and gentlemen. We've reached our comfort zone, but I believe that God, before he brings revival to this county, before he brings revival to this body of believers right here at Willing Vessel, he's going to bring you and take you out of your comfort zone and put you in a place that where all you have is him to rely upon. <laughs> Say amen, somebody. And that's all right. Zechariah chapter 4. Look at verse 1. And the angel that talked with me came again. Now, the one he's referring to here is the governor of Judah. His name was Zerubbabel. Say Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel. He was the governor of Judah. All right? So he, uh, Zechariah has a vision concerning him. Verse 2, And said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick. Everybody shout church. church. Now, in prophecy, there's always a double reference. When you see candlestick, you can't just think of a candlestick. Because you can go to Revelation chapter 1, where John the Revelator on the Isle of Patmos, banished to die, has a vision of Jesus Christ. And in the midst of that vision, he sees a golden candlestick. And he said, what does this mean? And, and, the, and Jesus told John, he said, these are the seven churches of Asia Minor, which represent the complete body of Christ throughout the church age, which means you and I. Are you following me? So we see candlestick here. Think body of Christ. All of gold with a bowl upon the top of it, and his seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps, which are upon the top thereof, and the two olive trees by it. Everybody shout two. One upon the right side of the bowl, and the other upon the left side thereof. So we have a vision here of a golden candelabra. 
all right? And there's a bowl on top of it, and there's pipes going to each one of the stems of that candelabra, and there's seven of them. Are you following me? Which represents, uh, and it's a picture of the continuous flow of the Holy Spirit. You see, in the tabernacle of Moses, the only light that they had was the golden candelabra. Say golden candelabra. That's the only light that they had. And it would illuminate the entire tabernacle. It was the only light that they had that would illuminate that place. And there was a continual flow of oil that would keep it lit. So, so in your life and in the life of this church, what will sustain it is the continual flow of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The continual flow of the Holy Spirit. Verse 4, so I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? Then the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these be? And he said, No, I don't, my Lord. Verse 6, Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. What is he saying here? What he is saying is that this temple will be rebuilt in Jerusalem. But it won't be by military might. It won't be by man's wisdom or intellectual ability. But it will be fully by the anointing and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Shout anointing. That's the only way it can happen. It won't be by intellectual ability. It won't be by plans that we make or programs or fundraisers. But it will be simply by the anointing and the presence of Almighty God. The way the body of Christ was birthed was that the Holy Spirit descended upon people who were praying in unity, worshiping God in one mind and one accord. And from there, the body of Christ, the Bible says, grew daily such as should be saved. How did they do it? They were sustained by the anointing of God. Shout yes if you believe it. Verse 7, Who art thou, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? So he had a mountain before him. He had a mountain of opposition. What's your mountain of opposition? Is it fear? Anxiety? Depression? Huh? Is it lust? Are you hungry for money? Is it your job? Is it your children? Is it your spouse? Is it your family? What's the mountain standing before you that keeps you from fulfilling the purpose God has called you to? Zerubbabel had a mountain. We're getting ready to build a big facility on this property. And you don't think there's going to be some bumps in the road? You don't think the enemy's going to raise his ugly head and try to hinder that process? Absolutely. Every time you start praying, here comes the enemy raising his ugly head. Anytime you step out to do something for God as a self-sacrifice unto him, the enemy wants to stop you from doing that because he knows you'll move into the position where God can use you. So we use excuses like, oh, well, we're just comfortable here. Or, well, we'll just stay here. Family goes here. Kids go here. They like it. I'm just speaking from my heart today. And you get into a place of comfort, and it holds you back from fulfilling the destiny that God has called you to. Because I can tell you now, when he wants to use you, he's not telling you where you're going. He's just going to tell you to go. That's what he told Abraham. He said, get up out of the earth of the Chaldees and go. And Abraham said, where are we going? He said, don't worry about it. He says, I'll show you when you get there. And Abraham just told everybody, he said, I'm looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. Hallelujah. And God brought him into the place of promise. And that's what he will do in your life. Shout amen if you believe it. And you'll be sustained by the anointing of God. Who are you, O great mountain? His mountain was Cyrus the king, who was hindering the building of the temple. Notice what the Lord says through Zechariah. Thou shalt become a plain. That means you're going to be flat. You're going to be flattened. And I can't help but think of the words of Christ in Mark 11, 22 to 24. If you don't ever memorize a verse of Scripture, memorize those three verses. Mark 11, 22, Jesus says, Have faith in God. Boy, if we could just master that, right? For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe those things that he says shall come to pass, he shall have what? Whatsoever he saith, and whatsoever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. Everybody shout, shall. You may not have it now, but what's the devil going to do with a church? What's the devil going to do with a bunch of people that know that they shall have it? There may be a bump in the road. There may be a snag here and there, but you know with a surety, standing upon God's word, that you shall have it. Hallelujah. Anybody believe this today? shall have it. 
and shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundations of this house, and his hands shall also finish it. Everybody shout, finish it. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you. For who hath despised the day of small things? Now listen, we have a small facility right here. But I'm telling you, it won't last long. Because God has a plan. And God has men and women to fulfill and walk out that plan and that process. Everybody shout process. There's always a process. I know it's hot and packed in here right now, but I'm telling you now, I can just envision it on this property where God is using people from around the world to come to this place to minister the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, maybe you don't believe that. I don't know. I, I never get that. You know, you, you, you tell somebody something, and, 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 and with, on the inside of you, you're trying to withhold yourself from shouting your, your, your lungs out, but, and then people look at you like you got four heads and, you know, sit there like a bunch of mummified Indians. I don't get it. I don't get it. Joel chapter 2, let's turn there. Shout yes. yes. Joel chapter 2. You want to learn something today? All right, Joel chapter 2. Joel was another prophet who prophesied about Pentecost. He prophesied about the outpouring of God's blessing and the outpouring of God's spirit. Everybody shout three. God works in threes. You realize that? Three is the number of resurrection. Christ resurrected on the third day, right? We are a body, soul, and three in one, one in three. You have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three in one, one in three, the triune Godhead, amen. In the tabernacle, you have the outer court, the inner court, and the holy of holies, three in one, one in three. Jesus said, now abides these three, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Third is always the best, right? Three in one, one in three. All right, let's read Joel chapter 2. Look at verse number 23. Be glad, then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain. Everybody shout former rain. Moderately. And he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. Now, notice. Notice he said he has given them and given us, the body of Christ, the former rain, which represents uh, the, the rain of God being poured out on the day of Pentecost. Now, I want you to picture this. Farmers in this day, they had to rely upon rain because they didn't have an irrigation system, right? So they had to rely upon rain. And the former rain, what it did for their soil, it would moisten the soil so they could sow the seed, right? For the latter rain to bring the maturity. So that former rain would come down and it would soak up the soil so they could put the seed in the ground. What's that a picture of? That's a picture of Christ. Christ was buried and he resurrected, right? He's the first fruits of all them who will die. First fruits of the resurrection of Christ. That's the former rain. Right after that, uh, on, on the fifth day after Passover, he sent the Holy Spirit into the upper room on the day of Pentecost, which we have the former rain. And Peter actually stood up and said it was a fulfillment of this scripture. You remember that? So now you have the former rain. But in between the former rain and the latter rain in the land of Israel, you had a cold wintry season. Now that cold wintry season sometimes would kill crops. It would bring judgment, if you will. And that's what happened to the nation of Israel, you see. Uh, from Pentecost all the way up until about, I don't know, 1948. They were in a place of death, a place of decay. They were in a wintry season. But in May 1948, Jerusalem and Israel became a nation in one day, just as the Bible said they would. And the hand of God has been on that nation all since their creation because God has a covenant with a man by the name of Abraham. And God keeps his promise. Say amen, somebody. But they went through a wintry season. They had the former rain, then the wintry season. Then about 1948, they became a nation which started the latter rain, if you will. Now that latter rain brings maturity to the crop. Now in that crop, we also have not only Israel, but we have Gentile believers, which is you and I. Say amen, somebody. 
So, so here we are. We're maturing, hopefully, to receive that latter rain of the outpouring of God. Do you hear what I'm saying? But notice what he said there. He says, I've given you the former rain moderately. That means he's only given us a little bit of what he's going to give in the latter rain. Shout amen, somebody. All right, let's keep reading. Verse 24. And the floor shall be full of wheat, and the fat shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sit among you. So in other words, he's going to bring great revival amongst the crops in the land of Israel. But there's also a spiritual significance here, because he's also bringing great revival to the body of Christ. Say amen if you're following me. He's bringing great revival. All right, let's read verse 27. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed, shall never be ashamed. Can I say that I am not ashamed of the gospel? Amen. For it is the power of God unto salvation. They're pretty people, but look at me, all right? The gospel is what brings the power of God into the hearts of each individual. When you present the gospel to somebody, that's the power of God unto salvation. The cross of Jesus Christ, it's an embarrassment. It's a shame to them who don't believe. But to you and I who do believe, it's the power of God. That's why you hear people make comments, well, the cross of Christ, that's just, uh, you know, not intellectual enough for them. That's because it's foolishness to them. But when the seed of God, God's word gets planted into their hearts, it will mature tour to a place of their lives being changed by God's power. Shout yes if you believe it. That's why it's important every lost loved one that you have, everybody at your job, everybody that, that's in your atmosphere of influence, that you sow God's word into their lives. You can sow God's word without being judgmental. I heard a man say one time, let's go preach the gospel. And if necessary, we'll use words if we have to. You can preach the gospel by the very way you live your life. Why don't you try loving somebody? Just put your arm around your neighbor and say, I love you in the name above every name, the name of Jesus Christ. And what you're doing is sowing a seed into their heart. Amen. Verse 28, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. That's your children. You hear me? Ladies and gentlemen, teach your children that they can hear from God. Teach your children that they can lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Amen. Instead of showing them Nickelodeon and all this other stuff, why don't you open the Bible with them and rehearse that thing? Sow the word of God into their hearts and let that spring forth into everlasting life. Shout yes if you believe it. Yes. <clears throat> your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. That puts me in that category. Praise God. Because I, I see visions. I got a vision of this place. Joe had a dream last night. I had a vision about this. Amen. Vision. Being able to see into the future, right? That's what faith is. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. That means you're assured that you will see in the future what you don't see in the natural right now. I can envision a facility on this property right now in my heart and in my spirit. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? And I know that God's going to bring it to pass because I can see it by faith. You have to see it by faith. Shout amen. amen. All right. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out of my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood, fire, and pillars of smoke. Now, go to Acts chapter 2. And we're going to see the fulfillment of that passage there, of that prophecy. Now, here we are. Christ has ascended to heaven. He's appeared to his disciples. And he's shown himself alive. Everybody shout, he's alive. He's, alive. he's shown himself alive. And then he's looking and gazing at his disciples, and he's carried away into heaven, and his disciples are discouraged. But before that, Jesus told them in Luke 21, 49, he said, Tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Everybody shout endued. That means to be clothed with to be uh, wrapped in, to be baptized, to be immersed into. He said, tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Tarry, that means wait, worship, pray, continue steadfast in the doctrine of Christ. Amen. He said, tarry. 
So you have 120 plus the disciples gathered in an upper room in Jerusalem. And they're praying and they're, they're seeking God and they're worshiping God. And in Acts chapter 2 verse 1 says, When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were in one place, one mind and one accord. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. Now imagine that. Who set upon each of them a tongue of fire sitting upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak. Everybody shout speak. With other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them the utterance. That doesn't mean the Holy Spirit took control of their body. That doesn't mean the Holy Spirit took them over and spoke through them. No, the Holy Spirit was ministering to their spirit man. And they obeyed what they were hearing in their spirit and spoke it out of their mouths. Now, many people call that foolish today. They do. They call it foolish. But that's fine with me because they call them foolish. If you read there, if you continue to read, the Bible says that they, 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 they came upon them. And they said, aren't all these Galileans? But here we, speak them in our, we hear them speaking in our own tongue and where we were born. He says, these, must, these men must be drunk. They're full of new wine. And then Peter stood up, standing with the eleven, Acts 2 says. And Peter stood with the eleven, and he says, Men and brethren, these are not drunken as ye suppose, but it's only the third hour of the day. That's nine o'clock in the morning. He said, But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, who said, In the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Shout yes, somebody. Now, I want you to notice one word there. You won't see it in Joel, but Peter said it. Now, think about this. He said, the last days, saith God. You see that there? I'm not sure what verse it is. 17, he says, in the last days. Everybody shout days. Now, Peter also said, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, he said, a day with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Now, I want you to think about that. He said, in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Everybody shout three. Remember, we went over three. All right, so from, from Christ and Pentecost until now is how many years? 2017, roughly about 2000, 2010. So according to Peter, we have two days right there because a day with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years a day, which puts us in what he prophesied as the third day or the last days, saith God. One in three, three in one. When the Bible says that he will pour out his spirit as the former and the latter rain in the first month. Oh, hallelujah. That means what came before in Pentecost will also come today and he will pour out his spirit upon all flesh your sons and daughters shall prophesy that means speak forth the wondrous works of God and it's being fulfilled what Jesus said in John 16 verse 7 he said nevertheless I tell you the truth it's expedient for you that I go away for if I go not away the comforter will not come but if I go I will send him unto you and when he has come he shall reprove the world of sin righteousness and judgment of sin because they believe not on my name of righteousness because I go to my father and you shall see me no more of judgment because the prince of this world has been judged and Jesus said I have many things to say unto you but you cannot bear them now but how be it when he the spirit of truth is come he shall guide you into all truth and he shall not speak of himself but whatever he hears that shall he speak what does that tell you and I that when the spirit of God is poured out upon your life you get a prayer language and Romans chapter 8 verse 26 says this we don't know how to pray as we ought we we don't know what to pray for and we don't know the will of God. How be it the Spirit of God makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Hallelujah. And he prays the perfect will of God. Shout yes somebody. The last days saith God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. John 14, 13, Jesus said, If you ask anything in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, that will I do. He said, If you love me, keep my commandments. And he said, I will pray the Father. 
that he may send you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it sees him not, nor does it know him. The world knows nothing about the Holy Spirit. He says, but you know him because he's with you. And guess what? He shall be in you. Hallelujah. And he said, I will not leave you comfortless. That means he won't leave you as an orphan. That means he's your father. He's your direction. He's your comforter and counselor and mighty God. Hallelujah. And he said in Acts 1, 8, you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. That's why he said, tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. That power gives you the right to tread upon serpents and scorpions and upon all the powers of the devil. Did you hear what I said? We're going to make a clarion call here today, all right? Listen, if you're in a place where you need to come back to Jesus Christ, Today is your day. You're not promised your next breath, much less another day. That's not by coincidence that you're here. If you want to come to the foot of the cross today and accept the Lord, this is your day. If you want to recommit your life, this is the day right here. Right here, right now. Right here, right now. You can do it. Whoever you are. If you need healing in your body, we can lay hands on you. The Lord is here, ladies and gentlemen. He's here. His manifest presence is here. I feel it. I feel it in this place. Whatever you're battling, whatever you need, can be taken care of today. Because he whom the Son sets free shall be free indeed. If you want to receive the Holy Spirit with the evidence of tongues, I can walk you through it right here today. It's for you, whoever you are. If you want a refreshing on this day of Pentecost, what happened to those at 120 in the upper room can happen to you today. In Jesus' name today before he sings let me appeal to the camera you worship god anybody watching on internet around the world you can receive the holy spirit today just come to jesus christ and confess him as lord of your life and he's faithful and just to forgive you of every sin and just look to him as the author and finisher of your faith and be filled with the spirit today god bless you